Well, I knew my guest was good people before I even met him. Because he spells his first name the right way, he's a Brian, I'm a Brian, with a Y, which is how it's supposed to be spelled. I might just be a little bit biased, but we are going to tell the story of Brian Terry here, Vice President of Development at Vice TV. On the Honest Something Podcast, I'm Brian Fenley, and we're going to explore his career, but also learn more about his human side. We're going to have a lot of fun and get to know him on a deep level and i'm an anchor myself fox sports radio and also work in live events and and brian excited to to have you on here if there was a little snippet of your life as you look at it that would befit a series on vice tv what would it be um that's really interesting um i mean i i guess the most fascinating would have been the end of high school beginning of college for me um i was just really fortunate to be hit with a giant wave of ambition and and um and it it kind of came out of nowhere in a way but but it really it was a real thing and it kind of got me to where I am today, but it was, you know, I was motivated. I really wanted to have a public access TV show uh, to interview bands. And I just, I loved music. I loved going to see live music. I loved reading articles about these artists and wanted to ask them questions of my own. So created this sort of thing in my head of, all right, let's do this. Let's try to figure out a way to meet all these bands that you spend so much time listening to and reading about and trying to see if you can talk to them on your own. And um, yeah, there is a period there from like 1993 through like 97 or 98, where, I mean, every band, I mean, every band I wanted to meet, I I met and most of them I interviewed to some level. Um, And so, yeah, it was a really, it was a crazy time, like getting those interviews, the situations, those, meetings would take me to and have me in um it was it was kind of crazy and so if there's and you know the 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 rock and roll of it all too i think would lend itself well to vice um but uh yeah that was that was probably like the the craziest ride for me you said brian you weren't sure where it all started but if you spent more time thinking about it and marinating over it where do you think that came from, that, that surge of, of passion and that work ethic? Yeah, I think, I think it was like at a time, you know, late high school is, is a huge time of, of judgment, right? You're, you're taking SATs, you're taking, uh, you know, you're getting into colleges, you're, you're trying to get into the honor society and and so I think for me, and, and a lot of my friends were like ridiculously good at school, you know, and, and good in those regards. And I was okay. Um, but I think it was like knowing that I had to find my own lane um, and seeing like, listen, I wasn't an all A student. Um, I didn't get the best test scores. Um, those weren't going to be my path to success. Um, but I knew because I consumed so much of this like music and music media and interviews and music videos, I knew sort of unique ways in. I knew it had been talked about and I figured maybe this, this could be my thing. And, and it seemed like the way my passion was already starting to boil out before I was doing anything, I saw that that was different than other, like the way I liked bands and the way I read about bands and sort of obsessed about things was different than other people. So already I was like, okay, there's something I've got to want here that other people don't have. Um, And so I think that was probably a part of it. And then just trying to sort of work off of that want and, and, and then early success helps, you know, having some people like when you're saying, oh, can you, you know, come be on my public access show or whatever, Having people say yes in the beginning, um, like, you know, just makes you feel like you can conquer the world. When you were doing those shows, what was your interview style when you went into Ah. these conversations? Here you are, you're being interviewed, and I'm asking you how you like to interview, where you have, you know, those in the band with you, and you're, you're trying to get something out of them that's unique and it's meaningful. In the beginning, I was, I mean, I was terrible. <laughs> I, I, was, I was terrible. I was really, 
I was a bad listener. Um, and I was so excited that it was happening um, that, yeah, it, in the beginning, there was a little bit just too much eagerness and excitement. Um, and I was so, I mean, I knew what I wanted going in so much. I was so focused that, yeah, probably I wasn't as, as strong of a listener um, and, and kind of understanding like, okay, reading the room a little bit, you know, those are all things that you learn over time that I, I certainly was just um, a, a dumb kid and like was sort of a bull in the China shop. <laughs> to this point and looking at where you've come from, starting from there and then all the way up through your career, where do you find yourself liking the challenge the most? Where do you like to challenge your most in, in what you do? Yeah. I mean, again, I think it, it, it's, it's still the same thing. It's, it's as sort of a constant and a consummate consumer. I, I just try to bring something new um, and something different. And, um, and I think that's really what I challenge myself to is, is, just thinking about ideas um, that are additive and sort of bring bring a purpose of why they exist because it's offering sort of a new and and I don't know. Hopefully, there's some refresh uh, like a refreshing angle to it all. But I think like the challenge, yeah. I just I never kind of want to just stay and do what's being done. I'm always trying to figure out like, oh, what if we combine this and that, or what if we incorporated this layer of this. Um, just trying to make things as like multidimensional as possible. Um, and, and what's cool is like, as my career has gone on, technology has allowed that stuff to happen um, to a crazy level. But it's cool because like, even now I can think about things and I'm like, I don't even know if this can happen yet, but I know it'll probably happen pretty soon. If it can happen today, it'll probably be able to happen in six months. So um it's, it's, yeah, always sort of like challenging yourself to push those limits on, um, on the way you're telling stories ultimately and trying to connect with people. How did you push those limits, tell stories, and how were you refreshing as, as in terms of your writing when you were at MTV and you were gaining traction and attention and you were making a name for yourself there? Yeah, I mean, well, right, that's, and that's, again, where it comes from because we're, you know, going back to TRL, like when I started on TRL, I don't know anything about Backstreet, nothing about NSYNC, none of that. I mean, I just didn't listen to that music. Um, but I certainly had respect for the fact that people cared about that music. I knew what it was like to have a favorite band and, uh, you know what I mean, obsess. Like I knew what that was like. So even though I couldn't get into the music, I, I could relate to like what they were about. Um, and so, right. So if, if I'm going to write, if, if the Backstreet Boys are coming in for an interview, I have to go and read every interview that they've done in J14 and Teen Bop and whatever, Frosty Tip Weekly and whatever the, <laughs> the magazines were, because how like literally mad I would have been as a fan of one of my bands. And here they come on MTV and they get asked the same question. I'm like, what? How did you know? So I really took myself to task of like, what can be something new and different? And it's crazy because now it's such a thing like with late night and Fallon and, and Corden, but like back then no one did Letterman a little bit, sure. but like no one played quote unquote with their guests. No one would do these things where it's like, Oh, Justin Timberlake's on, he's into golf. Let's get him putting while he's asking questions, you know, um, you know, Will Ferrell's on, he's on for Talladega nights. Let's get him to enter in like a power wheels, like, you know, like, let's really think about how this is fun and, and memorable. And again, really fortunate that, you know, it kind of takes two to tango. When people, when the guests would come to TRL, they knew it was a different beast, right? And they knew they had to kind of be playful and do something different. Um, so that willingness also helped. But I mean, it was really, again, just every day, every day we had the biggest celebrities on in the world and every day. And we had like three or four of us coming up with the ideas, right? This wasn't a writer's room of 20 people and 10 wow. producers. There was like three, four, you know, people really coming up with the ideas for a daily show. Um, and some of the ideas are garbage for sure. <laughs> but, but that also teaches you a lesson. Like it's TV, nothing sacred, like try it. Like, 
it's okay if it falls on its face. Just, you know, admit it and be like, okay, that didn't work. Tomorrow we'll try something else. Brian Terry is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. As far as ideas that are garbage or, or writing styles that peeve you or aren't exactly your liking, what is that? What does that look like when you're looking at writing and you're thinking about scripts that sort of like turn you off or, or you don't think in your mind would be a success? Yeah, I mean, it's such an off, uh, you know, perhaps an overused term, but there's an authenticity to it. And, and I think that's ultimately what I connect with. And I think what most people connect with across the board, it's, it's not that, oh, it's so much this style. It's like this style matches that person, mm. right? Like, and I think like Lena Dunham is a wonderful example of this. Like if anyone else tried to do what she did, I think most people are like, oh, it's a little, it's a little much, it's a little, but like there's something that just it is her. And, and it's just her writing is a continuation of that often. And I think like that's why so many people connected with her. Cause it's like, God, a lot of people have tried to do this, but no one has like hit it. And like you just embody it. And so I think for me, that's what I always um gravitate towards. And 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 you know, kind of going into what I do currently at Vice, that's a really it's a really delicate thing because yes, on one hand, I'm trying to program and develop for cable, which is, you know, usually a little artificial and produced and sets and makeup. And we're trying to deliver an authentic voice in that sort of uh, mechanism, which is, which can be tricky, you know, but I, but I think that is ultimately like what you're trying to do or what I'm trying to do specifically is, is find those authentic voices where it's not like, oh, this guy is, or this girl is playing this role or trying to sort of like present. It's like, no, they live this, they breathe this. And going off what you're saying, in a way, you're like a gatekeeper towards deciding, would this fit for Vice? Would it not? And keeping a keen eye on, on talent out there, writing styles and, and all of that. To be a gatekeeper and to, to feel like and to realize that your decisions play a big part in the trajectory, maybe, of somebody's career, how does that sit with you, knowing, you know, the role you play in, in so many others? Um, it's super inspiring. I mean, because at the end of the day, like, you can, you get to champion people, you know what I mean? And if it works out, like I have a great example from True TV. There was a guy um, by the name of Prentice Penny. And Prentice at that time was, um, he was a very established television writer, had written for some huge shows, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He had just gotten the show running gig for Insecure. So that show was just about to start, maybe it was in its first season. But Prentice came to me and wanted to pitch a show where he was actually on, on camera. And he's great, very, you know, handsome dude, very smooth. And the point is, is like, I got to work with someone like that, take a chance, give him his own first show. And while that show itself didn't go on and do a bunch of seasons, it was so cool to one, work with someone who is like so clearly on his way up and also just be able to like add some fuel to that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, he was gonna do what he was gonna do regardless of me, but I know, and I can like, I take comfort in the fact that he's up there, he's, he's killing it and doing amazing things. And I at least gave him some fuel to help him get there. That, that like, to me, that's super cool. That feels very gratifying and fulfilling. And so that's where you focus on what I focus on. I mean, the no side of it is like, it's it that's reality right like i wanted to be an nba player guess what wasn't tall enough wasn't fast. <laughs> like, okay no guess what no brian it's not going to happen and, and so you know that's what i'm always willing to take pitches as long as people are willing to hear no and like even the greatest people hear no way too much way too much what was a no that you heard in your career that you used as some motivation or or inspiration um Sure. Uh, I've had a couple. Um, I think, and I think it's, I don't know if they were inspiring, but made me sort of rethink 
strategy, right? And maybe like, mm, like not necessarily like, oh, I didn't get it. And that's going to make me work harder. It was like, oh, maybe that's a dead end. So shift where you're focused. And I'll give an example. So when I was in college, um, again, like doing my show, and I knew I wanted to intern in New York City, wanted, you know, come to New York and do an internship. And, you know, Letterman was like, let's, let's go for it. Let's write to Letterman. And, and, you know, and so I wrote to Letterman and blah, blah, blah. I wanted to be an intern and I do this public access show and blah, 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 and didn't get it. And uh, I remember talking to someone like, oh, I didn't get the Letterman internship. They're like, yeah, you know how many people probably apply for that? And I was like, how many? And they're like, probably like thousands and thousands of people. And chances are the people who get it are like, you know, some of them probably know somebody, whatever, you know, and I didn't know anybody. So that no made me be like, okay, you like late night. Letterman isn't going to happen. The next one in New York was at that time Conan. And I was like, well, Conan's on NBC. And I was like, oh, wait, what if I went to the Daily Show, which had just started with Craig Kilborn, which I was also into. I was like, I bet you maybe that might be. And so I wrote to them, same sort of thing, and then got that internship. Um, which was so cool and, and great. And so I think that, and there've been a bunch of those where it's like, you, you maybe try for what you think is the goal and you don't get it, but it allows you to sort of take stock on like, okay, maybe why you didn't get it or, or what would be a path to maybe achieve the exact same thing in a different way. Um, and so I think that's an example of a no that, yeah, just motivated me to think differently. It's interesting because, you know, you work in, in what scripted, non-scripted and, and there's a part of your, yeah. non-scripted. Yeah. So there's a, there's a part of your career in, in non-scripted where you acted off the script, you know, you had a script that you thought, okay, I'm going to go this way. No. It, and then I'm going to go another way. And it actually worked out pretty well for you. And how many times do you think in your life where you had something that you were set on, you were scripting out, you were thinking and you were imagining. And then you made the pivot, acted off the script and it worked out. I'm sure, Brian, that that was one of many times in your life where you've had to rebound and it's worked out well. Yeah. I, and I think um, for me, it's like. I have a I have a pretty macro focus as far as like what I'm trying to do. Um, and And so because of that as long as like I'm, I'm filling sort of that macro focus, I'm okay. And, and so it doesn't necessarily pertain to a specific job or career or role. Um, it's, it's more of, you know, are you motivated to create? Are you able to be a part of a team? Are you able to sort of contribute to something where there's success that gives you like, those are things that I'm into. Um, and so that, takes a lot of different shapes and forms. And I think that sort of that point of view has allowed me to maybe, you know, get fired, have a show get canceled, um, you know, break up with some, all these things that happen in life that sometimes like throw you for a giant loop. Um, you know, you, you kind of like, okay, that stuff that stinks, you kind of figure yourself out. But like, as long as for me, because I haven't been so hyper focused on a thing, there hasn't been like a thing that could like take me off that path. When you think about the focus of your career and, and what you've done, where it's taken you, how much does that, in a way, get in the way, or at least you're self aware of it from other things? Because when we are so focused, we're so driven in our careers, and rightly so we obviously sacrifice other things. So how do you deal with, with the whole being gung ho about work and then trying to appreciate every waking moment, which can be hard when you're in the throes of, of working in the media business and there's always something to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I am, I am fueled <laughs> by like positivity and optimism as cheesy as it is. Like I just, it's just sort of the way I I've chosen to, to go about things. And I, and, and again, like I think back to those days of doing TRL and, and again, really seeing like the more fun we were having it all, it all, it was all additive, right? The more fun we were having, the more happy we'd be on set and the more happy the host would be and the more like, 
so you just learn that like, oh, there's like, there's something contagious about like this spirit and this energy. And yeah, things are going to happen that, that are going to, you know, dampen that or, or, or throw a wrench in it from time to time. But like, if you're not having fun doing this, <laughs> like, what are you like? Cause that's what you do it for. I mean, some people do get rich and good for them, but like most people don't. And you've got to just do it because you love doing it because ultimately you're trying to transfer, like transfer this energy, this spirit, this like fun. I'm trying to do something that's in my head and transfer it to you, the viewer and be like, oh my God, I like this. And like, if I'm not in a good, happy headspace, like I can't do that. I know there are some people who are like, oh, I've been up all night working on this and I mm. overthink it. And I, you know, I'm on version 37 of this and here it is. Like, I'm not that I, I am like, let's keep it fun. Let's keep it simple. Um, and, and really like, hopefully that spirit translates and, and if it doesn't, then okay, it's, it's, I'm all right with it. How far back can you trace that spirit, that, that energy you had towards always. your outlook on life in general, always. not just even in work? Yeah, no, just I, always. And like, um, God bless my friend's parents. Cause I was the kid who was like at their house at 7am, like ringing them the door, like, is he ready to play? And they're like, no, he's <laughs> asleep and will probably be asleep for like another hour. Like, and I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to ride my bike in your drive. Like I was that kid. Right. And like now I've, as I have kids of my own, I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I could deal with that kid. Like <laughs> even having one or having my kids be friends. Like I was a lot. I was a lot, a lot, a lot. And always trying to pull my friends like, oh, what about this? And we should try this and let's videotape this and make this and we can make this TV show. Or what if we made this video or a skateboard movie? And they would just be like exhausted probably at times. Um, so now like they're just like, okay. It does, like they all are like, okay, this all makes sense because you've just been sort of annoying about this for a long time. How do you find a bit of yourself in your kids? Where does that come out oh. mostly? <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. That's such a trip. It's, um, so I have two girls, so it's, it's a very, it's less direct, right? Like I'm sure there's other, like just physically, like one of my girls looks exactly like her mom and like, um, they both look much like their mother. Um, but they'll just be like certain looks or like things like little things I'll say, and they'll kind of give me a look of like, Oh, I get like, I get that. Um, so it's, it's more in like comments and sense of humor. I think my, my um, older daughter certainly has some of the spirit of like, she's always been sort of fearless of like going into new rooms and talking to people. And she, you know, sings and dances and likes to perform on stage and things like that. So there's a wonderful spirit I see in her. Um, and then the other one has a little bit, I see a little bit more of like, the sarcasm and a little bit of the cynicism and a little bit of the, like the eye rolling, um, much to my dismay, but you know, I, I deserve it. Oh, you deserve it. How do you channel in your, I guess, itch for performance? You, you see your kids do that, but like for you, how do you satisfy sort of that part of, of what you are like? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly dwindled like my design like I used to really like to do that stuff and and for me like going out in New York City was my outlet like you could be anybody on any night it literally perform any character and people would just go with it and just like whoa that guy like why is he wearing all orange like just you know so I think and my friends like to do that kind of stuff too so there was a lot of us just like goofing around um you know just like yeah, taking on characters, going like, you know, we'd get invited to parties because we were working at MTV or whatever, but then we would go to those parties and pretend we were like a, a band or, or we'd go, there was one time we went to one of these parties and we pretended we were working the door. So we showed up and then we sat in front of like the VIP list or the VIP area. And rather than like go in and like have a drink, we sat out there with like a clipboard and we're like telling other people who could, and it was just stuff like that, where it was just silly stupid stuff but like that was how i sort of scratched that itch how would you in going back to that moment rate your acting skills and how well that you were able to convince others what you were i don't know i mean it was late i have no idea <laughs> I, it, 
the we had a we had a willing audience right and i think that's a huge part of any performance is like we had a very willing audience of like people just didn't question things the way you'd think and i mean <laughs> There, there was one story, there was one prank that a buddy of mine and I did that got so far. It was about him having a fake, he was at some event and a woman asked if he had a dog and he didn't have a dog, but he decided to say he had a dog. And so he got a stuffed dog and pretend it was a real dog. And they made, a, they did a whole interview about him in this animal magazine about he and his dog and how he took his dog once to Regis and Kelly and how it didn't like Regis, but it loved Kelly. And there was no dog ever, ever, ever. And so flash forward, my buddy gets to go on the David Letterman show and as a guest, and he tells this story. And at the end, he just throws the dog across the floor like a frisbee. <laughs> and it was just like, so like those sorts of things where like, it, that was honestly a, a prank that went on for like two years and like it got paid off on the Letterman show. Like that's just, that's bananas, you know? And so to, to be someone who likes to do that kind of stuff and have it, play out on that state like how could I be anything but like not grateful for like the way things are going in my life you know like it's pretty crazy but I'm really aware of like how crazy it is and how and, and I I drink it all in like I'm very like I get I get a thrill and a rush it's not lost on me how how unique and uh, special those sort of performative moments were and let's my final question for you Brian Terry is with me I'm Brian Fenley you, you said the word grateful. How do you show gratitude for what you've done and what you've been able to do? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one is like having a clear understanding of, of a bunch of it being just luck and circumstance and, and not trying to like inflate my sense of self through this. Like, I know that I'm, I'm creative. I know that I work hard. I know that I've always like strived to do big things. Um, but, but I also know I get really lucky along the way and I've had really um, impactful people and people with sort of um, power help me, you know? And, and so I try to do that and, and try to be as helpful as, as possible and encouraging and, and sort of, um, yeah, champion like as many people as possible, you know? And I look at like, you know, the, the, the people like when I was able to first start of like hiring people, you know, when I first had a production company and I could bring on writers or directors or producers that I liked, um, and, you know, give them a job. Like I look at where some of those people are now and it's, it's really cool. You know what I mean? And so like, that's, that to me is kind of part of the circle and, and knowing that like, I, I feel, you know, uh, a real need to be like a mentor and, and to really sort of encourage others because I know how that encouragement and those chances like paid off for me and what I kind of did with them and, you know, to, to run with. And so if I can give people that, um, you know, that's what I try to do. Oh, Brian, that's why I, I like you because you, first of all, your positivity, which we, we discussed, you have been so giving in terms of opening up opportunities for others and and then to see how those have come and used that opportunity and grown their careers. That's got to be really a source of pride for you to see how many careers that you have influenced positively. And while you might not be in, in a rock band that you covered when you were first getting the business, you are one of the main acts here at Vice TV and you deserve to, to feel like you are a rock star in, in a way. And so uh, Brian Terry, I'm Brian Fenley. Of course, Brian is vice president of development at Vice TV. I'm with Fox Sports Radio and other entities. Brian, thanks so much for the insights and just the transparency. Really enjoyed the conversation. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, it was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, listen, we'll, we'll, us Brian's with the Y, we'll always have our, you know, <laughs> We'll do our secret handshake off the air. Yes. But, uh, no, I, I appreciate the time.